for the next. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Rosemary Riel. I use she and her pronouns, and I'm here today with my colleague, Saquon Manka. Um, we're both assistant directors for the Source Center here at Johns Hopkins University, and we are the co-leaders of the Source Service Scholars Program. And today we're going to be reviewing, um, giving you an overview of the program, and hopefully by the end of this session, everyone will be excited about the program and ready to apply. Um, but before we get started, I um, want to share our land acknowledgement. So before all our presentations, um, we want to share that we humbly acknowledge that Johns Hopkins University is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of indigenous people. Our campus resides on unceded lands of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples, and we recognize the enduring presence of more than 7,000 indigenous peoples in Baltimore City, and including the Piscataway, Lumbee, and Eastern Band of the Cherokee communities. Uh, we gather from places across the country and globe, and we honor and recognize indigenous peoples of our homelands. And so um, there's a couple of links there if folks are interested in learning more about the legacies of survival and resistance of our indigenous communities, um, and to learn more about who cared for the land you live on. There's a link there that's um, a resource. With today's agenda, we're gonna introduce the Source Service Scholar Program, which we call SSS. Uh, we'll give you some examples of the projects. Um, we'll give you an overview, not only of the student responsibilities, but of your preceptors and the CBOs, and then more about the student application pro process and go through some FAQs. Um, I want to encourage folks, if you have questions as you're going along, exactly, <laughs> um, to please put them in the chat and, um, uh, Saquon will be happy to kind of, will be able to feel free to ask them as we go along um, as well. So if there's something that's muddy in the information that I'm sharing with you, go ahead and put your questions in the chat um, and then we can kind of go through the flow of the information um, and, and get people on the same page as much as possible. All right. So the Source Service Scholar Program is one of our long-term commitments um, to the Baltimore community. So the Source Center, um, really we are the community engagement center that serves uh, the schools of medicine, nursing, and public health. And this is our one of our special programs that um, we coordinate with over, we have a process where we have uh, proposals available um, we gather projects from our community partners, our community-based CBOs, um, and we, we work with them to, over the course of an academic year, um, we link them to a service scholar and require the service scholar to work 150 hours of service. In the upcoming academic year, it will be hybrid. So our partners have requested projects that have both on-site and virtual service. So that's what the format of the collaboration will look like. There's a stipend of uh, $1,750 $1, um, that goes to the students um, and is paid out in two, um, chunk, two sums of um, halfway through and at the end. It's typically June to May um, is the commitment. Um, that we are in our second round of applicants. So um, you're, peers that are already have been accepted as scholars in the spring are starting some of their preparation activities already. I mean, really we are asking, the program asks that you maintain a consistent presence with the CBOs throughout the academic year. And so on average, that's three to four hours a week. So if you understand that the time commitment, that's approximately what it will be. Our CBOs know that you are students first. And so, um, certainly, you'll have some flexibility about not working during breaks and, you know, if your finals periods are pretty intense, you know, a lot of this is, is establishing um, good communications in the beginning of this, of the uh, experience. I mean, again, it's open to all students enrolled in um, public health, medicine and nursing. And um, in addition to being connected to the project, Really, we see our source service scholars as leaders, and so you'll be leading a small team of students, minimum of four across the three schools, so it's very interprofessional, um, to help you operationalize the projects that were identified by our partners. All right, so that's just part of the overview. And then, 
you know, you won't, you're not alone. So you're, you're going to be receiving training and guidance from um, our source staff. In addition to your preceptors, we're going to be focusing on service learning theories and reflection practices to support you throughout the academic year, really focusing on interprofessional competencies, and you see what those are now, um, as well as project management, um, volunteer recruitment, and delivering and reporting out on your project outcomes. So those are, you know, what we're we will be, you know, our role is to help um, walk alongside you all. Um, our trainings are delivered through our Source Service Academy, which are, um, which happen maybe not every other month, but there are six total in the course of the year. And then you're also assigned a staff member that will either be myself or Saquon, and we'll have one-on-one -on -one advising and consultations throughout the year. So we're accessible. So, you know, we are here, you know, to help you develop professionally and personally um, throughout the year. So I'm going to hand it over to Saquon to talk a little bit about the, the nature of the projects. Sorry about that. I was just answering a question in the chat. And just to help you all out, um, if you are an international student, you are eligible for this project. You just have, but because it's hybrid, that means that it's going to be some remote and some in person. So if you can be available in person for some of the time, and you're good to go, but, as, but it's not strictly 100% remote. Um, all right, so it's moving right along into the projects. Sorry, everybody, transitioning. Ah, okay, so basically we have, our job is to assist the community and to provide support to the community. So with that being said, we reach out to them and ask them to submit their proposals about what they might be doing. Um, we, we accept up to 15 source service scholars. So we'll have different uh, community organizations and hopefully that means that we have 15 projects. Uh, each of you will, you know, the selected people will lead the projects and um, right now for the first, the first spring 22 round, we have nine, pro we have nine projects. We're seeking, I think, I believe it's six more, correct Rosemary? for the six projects that we have in now. Um, so rem rem remember that if you're going to be in this role, you are not an intern. You are a, you are a coordinator. You are, you are somebody who is leading a project. So it's a project management piece. Um, if you could just go right over to the next slide. Um, so just, to, just to, uh, to lay out some differences between what is an intern and what is a project manager, um, you can clearly, everybody here can clearly see uh, intern with more along assist with regular program management activities, whereas you all are the prospective candidates for this, you are putting together and managing and overseeing the program activities. So in a sense, your volunteers might be, might take the intern role, but you're not you. Um, and then you can see here, there's some other, there's some other examples. So. Uh, let's just say uh, we had a let's say we had a project where you were trying to do uh, capacity building and outreach, and you were helping an organization build out a platform to communicate. Uh, that would be something that you would be that would be something that you would be in charge of. Your volunteers would be the ones uh, managing the activities, and the um, and the organization would be the one assisting you with managing the activities. It would be your job to put the actual project together to find maybe find the software that you all were going to use to find the ways to the best ways to engage the community so like that's really the and then and then uh the volunteers would be the ones maybe like reaching out to the different people um and doing more of the like the the ins and outs of the intern work um if you could just continue with the slides i think we got a question i can answer real quick do we have to get the volunteers for our project ourselves yes and no right so yes, you are responsible for getting the volunteers. You are, you are responsible for getting your four volunteers, minimum of four, but you are not alone in this, uh, in this endeavor. Um, Rosemary and myself are here to assist you if you have issues rounding up volunteers. Um, moving, moving along to the project examples. Uh, so right here we have uh, development and implementation of health-related curriculum or educational workshops. You could do community outreach, advocacy program design uh, ex, uh service uh, service extension of the organization basically we are trying to we're asking the community organizations what do you need how can we help 
what are projects that you want to do that you need but you just don't have the the bandwidth to complete we have students that are in, that have an interest in these projects an interest in these topics and they're more than capable of doing something for you uh, creating a project and creating a project that has sustainability okay um yeah so these are just some more in-depth uh, these are just some more in-depth uh, versions of the project examples. So you can see implementation of a health-related curriculum. Your role would be to develop a plan and examine, like a needs assessment, figure out, uh, figure out the evidence-based practices behind it, get the stats, uh, maybe a SWOT analysis, um, and then building the curriculum where your volunteers would really be examining the actual curriculums that are already out there they'd be doing more of the groundwork uh, just, just, to, just to reiterate that. So when you're the project, when you're the project lead, we really don't want you, your job is not to be running to get coffee. It is not to be pushing papers. It is to be planning and implementing an actual project that is going to be used in Baltimore City that is going to help the community. All right. Um, all right, if we could just right along and once again these are more examples of uh different projects uh in terms of the advocacy and everything like that i'm not really going to read off the slides for you because all this information will be available to you uh and uh yeah we can just keep running it yeah and i think the point of the last two slides are really just try to help you and also our partners kind of be able to identify the make some distinctions about what your role as a scholar and the service lead will be and what the potential role of the volunteers could be so really trying to expand um, your orientation um, and your impact um, by like leading a team for these projects so when we put these calls out to the our community-based organizations and our partners we really strive for them to be um, kind of strategic areas, like priority areas that they'd like to grow, so growth areas. And so, you know, they might have an idea, but they don't have all the details. So the scholars are really there to sort of co-create with them um, what, you know, some directions and, you know, provide some recommendations. And so it's not going to be a, a totally fleshed out outline. You're going to have some yeah. objectives and, and some areas, you know, that they're interested in, but really working together with your preceptor and then to develop a team to go out there. Um, I see a question. Is there a scope to modify the projects after discussions with the CBOs? Yes, as long as the CBOs are in accordance with that. And again, a lot of that flexibility happens of, you know, time constraints, you know, people constraints, constraints happen. And so I think a lot of these projects are kind of wish. So are also mobilizing from their end, their staff as well. So you will be, you know, you'll have a preceptor, but then depending on the size of the organizations, you may be working with a different staff in the organization as well. Um, so there is some flexibility. that's um, sort of agreed upon um, with the CBO. We've definitely seen a lot of adaptability right. as we move along, for sure. That's a, that's a key uh, quality um, and, that scholars will. And I just wanted to also chime in. I know this this seems like a lot of, of work, but keep in like some things that you might have never done before, but also keep in mind that this is congruent with the actual uh, SSS course. So like while you're, doing if you if this is some of the first time you've ever done any of this stuff you're also in like a course that's helping you that's teaching you as you go to to apply these to the real field to real life situation so it's booked directly to the field yeah and so um and students can also use their sss project so as the program is is uh, designed, it's currently co-curricular, but certainly as you see the scope of your project and you're getting to, you know, you're digging deeper into your um, academic coursework, it, it has often been used as practicum. So we work in concert, we're part of the MPH practicum team. So if students are interested um, in using this as their practicum, we can work with you. We know that, you know, to have, we could work with you to submit um, all the approvals and registrations to make this a practicum. And then likewise, um, it's possible, but again, you could potentially use it as a capstone, which is different than a practicum hours. You know, you'll learn that a little bit more, but I mean, you could use it potentially um, 
again, there's some different criteria. Um, and then potentially, depending on where you are in the medical school, um, if, if you are focused on a scholarly concentration, we could work with you. So you'd work with your source advisor. Again, that will be assigned to you, um, one of the two of us, and we can work and guide you to see if it's um, feasible. But we definitely know that the practicum is something that many of our past source service scholars have done, but the capstone and the scholarly concentration might need a little bit more um, coordination um, in advance. So this is a slide of what your preceptors are, ex are expected to do. You'll have a primary and a secondary um, preceptor. And we have typically had that because, you know, there's a lot of turnover in nonprofits. And so it's really important for us um, that, you know, not just your preceptor knows what you're doing, but the whole organization and another person on the team in the event that that person leaves the organization. We've just had that experience in the past. And the more that you, um, the scholars integrated into the, uh, uh, culture of the organization, you know, the better. Um, you know, they have um, some onboarding they will have as well to help prepare you. You know, we require the preceptors to have regular and frequent meetings with the scholar. Um, to, again, provide that appropriate guidance. So, to that question about flexibility, can some of the scope change? Yes, it can change. Again, as long as you, you know, it's agreed upon. You know, we have seen, um, we've had, we have had to adapt as we all have um, due to COVID um, and due to just like other life circumstances. So as long as that, you know, good communication and coordination is happening early on, I think it makes any changes um, that need to happen later, um, sort of more easeful. Um, and then also, we really are asking both our preceptors and our scholars to think about the sustainability of the project. You know, what would the handover look like? Um, you know, what resources can the scholar create so there can, can be a handover to potentially a staff person? Or what are the materials? You know, so that, you know, we're really trying to avoid sort of a one and done kind of project. Really, that's why we've asked these projects to be something that is a strategic project for them, so that has a, a lifetime. And you, some of the projects you may be working on, may be building on um, other projects as well. So um, ask them to complete a mid and final year evaluation. They will be verifying your hours, so the 150 hours that you're required to complete, and again, that flexibility piece. So that's what we um, um, are requiring. Um, and these are our service scholar expectations. Um, attend all of the academy sessions. So hopefully all of you have seen the, um, all of you have seen the information sheet with the projects, the six projects, the CBO projects outlined. There are dates. Please make note of those. Um, those it's really critical that you participate with us. You know, complete reflections and reading assignments associated. Um, so that's including the summer and um, in, you know, throughout the academic year. We're going to have a system for reporting hours within Hopkins Engage. It's a platform that you'll be trained to use. Um, again, recruiting at least four volunteers uh, from the health professional, you know, across the health professional schools. You may be recruiting volunteers who are outside, but for our program, it's at least four across the health professional schools. Again, meeting regularly with advisors, regularly with the preceptor, et cetera, and same um, requirements as we had of the preceptors. This is Hopkins Engage. We just wanted to introduce it to you. You actually have a profile in there now. Um, if so if you haven't, um, you can click on or you can Google Hopkins University Give Pulse. And that's the online platform that has all of our organizations. It has your profile. And so um, you'll be able to actually even explore. Um, and that's what many of our scholars will be using and what we'll be using in the upcoming year to exchange information um, and where you will be entering your hours. I'm going to pause right here to see if there are questions that Saquon has been answering and might want to just voice um, for our folks that will be listening in. Yes. Yeah, so real quick, uh, uh, I'm trying to see. Somebody asked, uh, can they see the projects? And I'll let them know that uh, shortly after this, we're going to send them all the information. And if you register for this Zoom info session, this info session, we'll be able to, we'll, mail, we'll email you and you're already on our mailing list. See your screen. Question, a question that I, there we go. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, make sure that you, if you, make sure that you all are on mute, uh, just for the communication purposes. Um, and then another question, another, 
another question. Another, I gotta keep. Primka, please stay on mute. I keep muting you. Um, but then uh, uh, another question was, uh, Rosemary, Mary, you can answer this better. Um, if you do uh, the the service project, uh, are you unable to do other? Are you able still able to do extracurricular activities? And uh, what I would answer to that is yes, you are. Um, understand that you're in a, a graduate program, and if you're going to commit these three uh, to the three to four hours uh, a week to doing this, it all depends on your time management. So I, I would strongly suggest being realistic with the time that you have. Keep in mind that if you're going to be a service a service scholar, that you are making a commitment to John Hopkins and to the community organization and to the people that this community organization serves. So just keep all that in mind and practice good time management. Yeah, very good. Um, were there any other questions or can we, should we, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and move along here. So these are some student application tips. And so this is the link here. Um, and Let's see, I might try to, Saquon, I don't know if you can can lift that link up and put it here. I think I might be able to do it as well. You, you can put it? it on, yep, I got it. So if folks want to link to that right now, that's fine. This gives a um, more detailed um, description of our the six projects that are available. In the application form, you'll be able to rank your top three projects of interest. You don't have to do three, you could do one, but at least one, obviously you're applying, um, but you could do up to three. Um, I would make sure, you know, of course, market your skills and your previous work experience. What makes you unique? Illustrate while you're a good candidate for the specific project. So um, that project descriptions came directly from the CBOs. Um, there's links to the CBOs, explore their websites, um, you know, you know, as much as you can demonstrate that you're familiar with, um, uh, you're familiar with, um, you know, their organization and, and why you would be a good fit, you know, that's really what we're looking for. So scholars typically, um, and then you have to be admitted and registered. So you have to be an enrolled student. I think that's um, clear and not graduating um, until May. I think that's the other thing we had previously, we had an applicant that actually, had applied but then was graduating in December and and, and was not um, uh, eligible. So you need to be, you know, uh, to be a student for the entire year. And so scholars have typically been full-time students who are located in the greater Baltimore area. We've occasionally had part-time students to participate, but I'm going to echo what um, Saquon just said, time management, if you're a part-time student, and then also working, is it realistic that you have time an extra three to four hours a week to to be a, a source to serve a scholar um, and then also note again all the projects so all of our cbos have um, required you know some in-person some hybrid work online work um, you know and generally during baltimore business hours so that's um, again so if you uh, that's that's generally what we've had and and i would say that a lot of the in-person may happen in the beginning and a lot of the orienting piece you know a lot of all of our cbos were asking them to create sort of you know in the first month you'll be orienting and so you actually may be doing some activities um, that might look a little interny just to get you familiar with the environment but that shouldn't be what you're doing for the course of the project it could be again in your orienting they may ask you to you know can you volunteer with us just so you get a sense of who our clients are and and how our staff works together can you come and like shadow and that might be part of like your hours and in, in getting um, onboarded to their organization so and this is the timeline um and again um july uh, 11th is the due date so in a couple of weeks by noon that's a monday um to please submit your your um, applications um, our internal review team will go through that from the 13th to the 18th so mark your calendars you'll hear um, what we will review the internal team reviews all of the applications and for each of the six projects they'll be assigned three or we'll select three to four four maximum um, names that will be moved forward to the second round so the second round is an interview round where each of the CBOs 
we'll be able to interview three to four candidates from the application pool. And so that will happen between July 20th and August 5th. So that's the period where we'll ask you to interview, um, to reach out um, if you're an applicant and you might get one um, organization or you might have up to three organizations that you can interview with. It all depends on how you've ranked and how we've scored the applications. And so um, this is just to show you that that's when the interview period is going to be between July 20th and August 5th. And at the end of that period, again, we will ask those students to initiate and, and schedule. The CDOs know that you will, will share their names and contact information, and it will be the students who initiate scheduling that um, time for an interview with them over the course of that period. And then both the preceptors and the students will rank order um, their students in the placements. And so by the beginning of August, you know, on or before Tuesday, August 9th, we will be doing the final matching and you'll be notified. So that is sort of the time frame of the application process. And um, you'll have up to within five days to accept. And if you accept, you're basically agreeing to all of the commitments that, <laughs> of the descriptions that we've shared, as well as um, we will have some materials that you'll need to complete um, for June and July. So there are modules, some training modules that you'll need to complete. Will there be another application round in coming spring? Yes, but for the folks that are, again, remember if you plan to apply for spring, that's going to be for academic year 23-24. So you'll need to be a student throughout that year. So it's possible if you're an MPH student or an MS um, student um, in a different program that you're here for a two-year program or if you're a medical student in a four-year program, yes, you can apply in the spring. But for folks that are, um, who will be uh, graduating in May, this is your time to apply. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, did I miss any other questions, um, Saquon, that you wanted to share? Uh, no, uh, just to clarify, um, Victor asked if they could combine this uh, project or this project with federal work study. And I just let him know that uh, they're two different because they're two different programs and they have completely different deadlines and requirements that it's, it's they, you can't combine. Yes, yeah, so it, you wouldn't be able to combine them, but they are different fu funding streams. So we do have some CBOs that may request federal work study. That's different from their projects that they have, um, that we're linking them with a source service scholar. So. We, have a, we have another question. Um, will there be any opportunity to contact or talk with current or past scholars? So if you look on our website, um, you'll see a list of scholars. Um, they don't exactly have their email addresses on there, but you'll have a sense of, um, you'll see the list of past scholars, their past projects. We have a couple of recordings on there for you to see sort of the end of the year, um, the end of the year presentations to get a sense of what their deliverables were, what their final presentations were, you know, what were some of the outcomes um, of their project and some of their lessons learned. Uh, that's the closest I could get you to um, kind of linking you or getting you, um, you know, offering some insight on past experiences. Um, but I would check out our website. We do have links to past projects and past scholars. Um, I will have to say that, you know, the source service scholars, we have up to 15 projects. So we actually try to target five nursing students, five medical students, and five public health students because we serve, you know, all three of the schools. Last year, we didn't have very many nursing students. So it was uh, medical students and um, uh, medical students and public health students. I think on our website currently, there we do have the first nine students and their profiles and bios listed to give you a heads up of who you know could possibly be your peers, like um, um, in the scholars in your scholars cohort. And I'm putting in. Uh, Great, yeah, thank you. Okay. Easy, perfect. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Thanks. And then the next, do folks want to, anyone want to go offline real quick? Because we have a, a whole bunch of frequently asked questions, but we might, you know, I want to hear from you. Um, does anyone have any questions um, that they want to jump on and go ahead? Marianne, I see you. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. You're good to go. 
Hi, thanks for uh, answering questions. Um, I was just wondering what the turnover process is usually like. So I see that the positions are usually about one year long. So if a, um, if a project is intended to be like a multi-year sustainable project in the community, what is that turnover process usually like, like so, past scholars and stuff? So for you, your, your, if let's say you get selected to be one of the, the scholars, you would do your project, but also part of your project would be a sustainability plan. So we're not continuing, source service scholars don't continue the same project, but they create a sustainability plan for whatever they implement so that the organizations can continue what they're doing. Yeah. Like we don't just like, okay, now we're gonna have another scholar fill, up, fill, uh, fill in, no, that's, that's not how it works. You create, it's a one and done. So you create a project, you roll it out, and then you also create a sustainability plan for them to use so it's actually feasible and relevant and it's not just for that one academic year. Correct. Okay, so that, that makes sense. Yeah. So your engagement is limited by the academic year. The activities of the project of the CBO, um, we hope, has some teeth in it. And so they'll be left with resources. So another staff person or there have, you know, you may also be walking into a project that another scholar has started, but it's a different, um, it, it's a different, uh, there, it's an offshoot of a project. So it's not the exact same source service scholar project from previous, but you may be working on a different angle of the same sort of strategic project area that was created. And sometimes, you know, one of the things that I heard from a CBO, one of our community partners that was really smart is that, you know, they've created these projects, these priority projects. There's a couple of different off ramps. <laughs> Again, because we know that um, time can, you know, there, there can be some life happens and so you know it's we wanting to have that um active communication so we can come to you know if we're running out of time if we've run into roadblocks how do we adjust together to still get to a point that you've helped them move forward um in the in the area so some might say well can that really happen in an academic year maybe but maybe parts of it can and so all of that is your conversation um and how you are able to mobilize a team to operationalize like the activities. So that's the thing that I think people get stuck. It's like, oh, do I have to do all of this? No, but you are also, that also um, requires a little bit of energy of getting, you know, do you get the team together early on <laughs> and then divide up? Or do you like develop the plan and then have it cl the clear roles and activities before you like get folks, um, um, before you recruit folks onto the team so like that's something that you can talk about with your preceptor is it like do we want to get folks to sort of um and and you're a part of that too because you'll be orienting you're going to be understanding their justice issues you know as much as like you're uptaking you're going to be the advocate for them as well <laughs> and so um and you know revisiting why you're interested how can you get more excited more folks excited about the activity as well so that's, you know, part of the reason, the leadership skills that, you know, you'll be exercising, uh, Marianne. But yeah, a lot of folks have, have gotten off the project, haven't completed it from what it looked like in the beginning, but it's still okay. <laughs> you know, again, a lot of that is, is uh, the collaboration um, and expectation setting with um, the partners. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, immediate questions. Do you see anything? Okay, because we have some frequently asked questions that will move along here. Um, and so the Saquon, if you want to, okay, so when will the first, um, how will it be uh, distributed? And so that I think scholars, the stipends in two installments, you know, again, you'll be tracking your hours after the first 75 hours are complete. Um, you know, again, aiming for mid-year, so December and May. And so in order to receive um, the stipend on time, um, again, confirm through assignments, updates. So a lot of communication with us that you're fulfilling your commitments and completing your hours. Um, can, can you continue as a scholar after the academic year ends? So answer to that is, um, the duration is only one full academic year. You know, you, 
you as a scholar, you're welcome to identify work beyond the scholar year, but the formal partnership with the particular project comes to a close at the end of the academic year. I can say just from listening to the scholars that just left and just completed this past May, many of them are still going to stay connected. You know, you don't commit over don't a leave. year with, <laughs> you know, informally or as you can. Um, consulting with them, volunteering yourself, you know, you become connected because the issues that are important to them become important to you. So, but the formal um, project comes to an end in May. Um, yes, you'll be assigned a source staff advisor um, at the end of this summer. So once we have our last six folks completed, Saquon and I will divide that up. So by August or September, you'll have your advisor assigned to you. Um, oh, this question, can I jump in real quick? Yes, please, please question? do. Yes. All right, and I'm jumping in on this. Yes, do I have to attend all Source Service Academy sessions? The answer is Y E S, yes. And that is because we're helping you prepare, where you're going out with the community, you have the John Hopkins brand on you. Uh, it is very important that you participate. Uh, worst case scenario, we have had some situations where students just simply could not attend our session. There was no way possible and it, it was uh, essentially an excused absence. In the event that that happens, uh, we will record sessions and possibly talk about makeup, but that's really case by case. Uh, are the community outreach, pro are the community outreach program at the School of Nursing and SSS programs the same or are they separate? Mm -hmm. All right. Oops. Oops. Trying to follow it. So they are yeah. um, they are two different they are two different programs, right? Um, but they're both two, they're both year long experiences, and they both work with Baltimore nonprofits. A uh, question to you, Rosemary, that you might know: Have do you know or have you heard of any students doing both programs uh, at once? Um. You know, I haven't. Um, I haven't heard them. And again, I would have to look to see what the time commitment is right. for the COP project um, and see if that would be feasible. Again, it's about time management. And so I would say, yeah, that's a great question. I haven't heard of folks doing both of them. Um, yeah, but, I would. Yeah, I would generally encourage question. people not to. I would generally encourage people not to. We have another question about um if we have this current schedule for the academic uh, the sessions yet for the uh, source service academy sessions. Yes, so those are at the end of the information sheet. So I think we put the PDF up there. So I think on that sheet is a list of the scholar commitments as well as the dates. Um, and that final date for the presentation, it's looking more like it's going to be May. Um. And so those Wednesday meetings, three hours might seem long, but we feed you <laughs> like the in person. You know, it's 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 something that you know it's it's our time to to build community as well and share across our experiences um, as well. And so three hours might be like wow, all online. No, we're hoping our aim is to be in person, with some exception if it needs to be hybrid. Um, as the year continues, these summer sessions have been about a couple of hours. Um, so we're going to be sharing for this group that's coming in, sharing the link to the June and July sessions that will be recorded um, and some assignments um, that they can manage and we'll have some time for them to complete to complete those um, modules, etc. So Abigail, I hope that answers your question. We'll move on. And so these are just some other questions very quickly. Um, can you choose your own CBO? No, not for this program. So our source partners have already submitted projects. We had a whole term for them to be selected. And so you, you wouldn't be able to use your um, um, for the source service scholars. Now, if you have us, if you are engaged in work with a current um, community based organization and are interested in seeing how that might work, you could reach out to Saquon and and we could uh, help that if we're not they're not a, a current partner, what would it look like to get the CBO that you're working with um, uh, to become a partner. Um, 
what says that? Do I have to put a reference? Do I have to have a reference? Sorry about that. Um, in the application process, um, you are at, um, that's optional. References will only be contacted if you move into the interview phase. So if you want to help us out and you know of someone, only one person will be contacted, not multiple references. So if you want to share the contact information and give your um, reference a heads up, um, that's fine, but it's not required. But in the event that you are selected um, for an interview, we're going to ask for that information real quick. <laughs> and so the turnaround is going to be real quick for that. And, the, um, and then those recommendations will be shared with the CBOs that are interviewing you. So it's really for the CBOs. And I think I already explained why we have two preceptors. And then actually, you know, this was a mistake on my part. I'll, I'll correct it before I share the slides. It says, can international students apply? Yes, they can apply. This was more about um, can remote students apply? <laughs> so I mistook it when I corrected this. International students, yes, absolutely may apply. Remote students, um, and I don't know if there are any of you out there, are really not eligible to apply at this time because all of our projects are either hybrid or in person. So you would be required to be in the uh, greater Baltimore area to have at least some on site time. And then last but not least, the volunteers do have to be, at least the four volunteers do have to be um, uh, from the health professional schools. Again, there are some organizations that have their own volunteer list that you may be coordinating, but for the um, scope of just a scholar piece, um, really it, it would be from the professional schools. All right. And then I'm gonna pass it back on to Saquon to see if we're having any other questions. Yeah. Yes. If you all have any additional questions, I have additional answers. <laughs> so feel yeah. free to just feel free to just chime in or drop them in the chat, and I'll be I'll be willing to more than willing to help you. I'm also putting my direct email address inside of the chat. So if you have any questions that you just you might think of later on, feel free to reach out. Yeah. Yeah. My only other tip is really. Um, to really uh, read the projects and speak to how your previous experiences um, speak to sort of their project requests. Any, you know, and you don't have to have experiences. I mean, you could also, you know, other skills that where you want to grow. Um, I think showing um, the reviewers. Um, yeah, so that that would be something, you know, and to spend a little bit of time on it. I think as reviewers, we can see if someone just like kind of is if something is a little generic and kind of put together, cut and paste. Um, there was a question on there is can folks reapply? We do encourage you to reapply, but um, really, again, focus on your ranking and the responses to the ranking. There's also a, a section of the application as a heads up that are scenarios that we've experienced. Um, and so think through how you might really um, respond if you were in those situations. Um, yeah. I would, and I would just second that, please, if you're gonna do this application, take, take some, sit down and take some time aside. Uh, a, few of our, a few ones that we've had in the past have been rushed. And if you're not giving details, then uh, you're really not gonna be considered because a lot of people are interested in this. And uh, just once again, what, what Rosemary said about like, if you don't have the experience, if you don't have the skills, that's still something that we're looking for because we're trying to give you all those experiences and those opportunities. So don't give us fluff, just be real and tell us what you want to do. And we'll, the whole point of that is so that we can best uh, partner you with the CBOs that will, that, that will best benefit you and the ones that you would benefit them. Two great questions in the chat. Um, one was any preference for how recent a reference should be. I would say within two years and someone who's going to be responsive to your communications. So if you haven't been in contact with them in a while, or if you want to give them a heads up and someone who could like respond um, in a timely manner, that would be, you know, a key, a key to who you select. Um, and then also, are we required to rank three projects? No, you aren't required. Um, you can rank just one, one or two. Um, but again, if you are ranking more than one, um, see how your responses differ <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you're marking them um, across. What is the source? Oh, okay, so that is a step. I'm gonna hand that over to Saquon. That's a little bit 
different. I'm going to see, does the reference need to be from Hopkins? No, they don't have okay. to be from Hopkins. Um, they, again, they can be from your home country. Again, I would select someone or give someone a heads up um, that this may be coming on the horizon if you're selected, in the event you're selected. Again, I would hate for you to select someone who then maybe isn't checking their email as often or who you couldn't confirm knew that the request was coming their way. Um, Saquon, there's a question about Yeah, I'm, I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm on it. I'm on it. Mm -hmm. All righty, and then he'll put that answer. Are there any other um, SSS questions right now? How are folks feeling about the application process and the information? Um, and the links are all there on the website. And again, um, you'll get these slides. And then even in that email from the slides, um, I think we have, we'll have uh, all the emails of the participants in the room, and we'll be able to send you follow up as well. Yeah. All right. I think we, if, if folks are good. Oh, you're welcome. If folks, um, you know, I think that's all we have to share right now. If, you know, we have about, you know, 10 minutes if one or two want to stay for other questions, but we can, um, again, I think we're set. Here is our, here is the last slide. <laughs> so if hopefully folks are feeling, feeling prepared. Um, to be ready to hop on the application. Any particular criteria on how the application's passed on for the interview round, especially if we may not have any background experience related to the project? Like, you know, if you don't have experience in the project, I think the second piece that we're looking at is how you would approach the scenarios and how, how you're expressing yourself in the scenario piece. So that's the second piece that we're looking at. Um, that again, our internal team are looking at if you have experience that you've been in any of those scenarios before that you were stuck in a pickle and how did you, you know, what were your, um, again, if you can speak to any past community engagement experience or service experience, that's super helpful. If you're demonstrating any reflection on something that didn't work well, that, you know, to do it differently, I, this is how I would do it, you know, differently. So those are, you know, some of the qualifications, you know, some of the qualities that we're looking for in your responses. Um, again, let's see. And any of them, am I missing any other questions? Hopefully that asked. Yeah, so even if you don't have experience in the project, I think there are really some really good ways to highlight um, your interest and past lessons that you've learned um, through community engagement, community engagement work. Um, can we send past community engagement in the form of a photo essay? Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what that means. Yeah. You, yeah, so, could you clarify? Oh, okay. All right. So I yeah, guess I think, I, I think I think what they're asking is, can they submit? Okay, no. When you do your application, when you do your application, you're gonna have to fill in the application base. Like you're not gonna have. It's not gonna be like, please submit this PDF to answer this short answer. No, you just have to. You're gonna have to explain. Yeah, type it, it in. So the yeah, there were some of the responses are typed in. The only um, PDF or Word document that we're requesting is your CV or resume. There isn't really any other space to upload. Um, your photo, a photo and, essay, and also, and also, a, a, a essay from a previous community engagement would not necessarily be tailored towards the question that application is asking you. So we're not, we're not. So when you're applying to be a, a search service scholar, make sure that you remember that you're applying and that you're applying to be chosen or selected over other people as well. So you want, it's, it's a job application essentially. You want your information to stand out. You don't wanna give us an essay that has a whole bunch of stuff in it that, that doesn't necessarily answer our question. So what I suggest you do is you can take the information that pertains to the source application from that essay and then, up, and then type them into the application. But as far as just throwing an essay that you use for something else in here, no, that's not acceptable. Yeah, and a photo essay, I mean, if it's linked, if it lives somewhere else, you can link it in your CV, but it won't be something that people would look at. Yeah. They're gonna look, they're only gonna upload and look at your CV and resume. They're not going to link to anything else other than that. So that that's how I would, yeah, great. 
Yeah. All right. So I think um, as I, you can stop the recording right now.